so that my hot take is been very fortunate to work at that intersection of corporate startups and interestingly VCs and having worked with a lot of product leaders, I think there's a there's a lot they could potentially take from adopting a bit more of a venture capital mindset when thinking about growth. I think if more product leaders could take adopt a VC mindset, then I think they would be in better position to actually drive not just long term both kind of short term and long term growth and actually build a much stronger product organization. Hello and welcome to another episode of One Night in Product Hot Takes Edition, where I speak to one person about one thing, get straight to the point and find out what's on their mind. Now, if you've got your own hot take, why not go over to onenightinproduct.com slash hot and grab a time. We can have a chat and find out what your hot take is together. But in any case, do remember to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube so you can make sure you never miss another episode again. But anyway, enough of me. Let's get straight to Chris Locke's hot take. So in front of me, I can see a somewhat blurry scene with a kind of interplay of lights and a, and a smiling, happy man with a beard who's just looking at me, waiting to talk. So I'm going to throw to you, Mr. Man, and ask you who you are, where you're based, what it is you do, and more importantly, what's your hot take? Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. Hi, I'm Chris Locke. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Aspire. Have been spent much of my life in product, both in corporates and in startups, and now running our own training business, helping uh, leaders and teams upskill uh, in large organizations. So, that my hot take is been very fortunate to work at that intersection of corporate startups and interestingly VCs, and having worked with a lot of product leaders, I think there's a there's a lot they could potentially take from adopting a bit more of a venture capital mindset when thinking about growth. A lot of the leaders we tend to talk to, when you talk about growth, it's about trying to do more, <laughs> more of what they've always done rather than thinking about, thinking about how does I as a lead actually deliver outsized returns? Like how am I going to sort of make sure the portfolio of the products I'm responsible for actually aligns to our growth ambition? That I'm able to fund it, in the, be able to fund it in the way it, we should be. That it's thesis driven. So actually, rather than it having been a lot of, I'll take orders from the business. How do you go out to the business? And actually, say, look, where are the opportunity areas that we emerging opportunity opportunity areas we think we should play in? How do we think? What's our kind of superpower that means we're going to win? And then let us build a kind of a let's go and sort of test a portfolio of small bets on validating where we think that those new business models, those new products, new services will look like rather than my experience of, of, of both in corporate and then having worked with large organizations is typically trying to take this one large bet and hoping that pays off, which it very rarely does. So that's kind of my, my hot take is that actually, I think if more product leaders could take a doctor VC mindset, then I think they would be in better position to actually drive not just long-term, both kind of short-term and long-term growth and actually build a much stronger product organization. Now, I buy all that, but at the same time, there's this kind of cliche about VC funding and, and VC investments, which is basically that you only need one of them to work, 99 of right. them can fail as long as, as long as the 100th one is the one that wins big. So from a product perspective, I mean, I guess you could also argue the same, but like these companies have limited runways from time, you know, quite often, right? And like, maybe even a limited risk appetite. And also if they're not owned by a VC and they're maybe right. owned by like a private equity firm that's not so risk tolerant, then maybe the concept of maybe failing 99 times is like the worst thing that they could hear. So like, how do you bridge that gap? Exactly. I think that comes back to thinking as a balanced portfolio. So um, when you think around, uh, there, there's a pretty good uh, research out there that shows Depending on what you're trying to do. So actually, if you're growing in your market and growing rapidly, that idea of your allocation should be 70, 20, 30. So 70% on your core, 20% on adjacent, 10% on transformation. If your industry is starting to go through transformation, that's 50, 30, 20. And if it's really kind of going through rapid transformation, 40, 30, 30. So the idea being actually thinking about it in that way means you mitigate the risk, which because you've still got to deliver today, which is say when you're backed by VC, you've got the luxury of thinking longer term. Whereas most of us work in quarterly targets. So by that balanced portfolio, it means you're, you're not sacrificing today for tomorrow, but you're able to have that balanced approach. So actually when your core products start to sunset and start to come to the metrics drop, you, you're not having that revenue cliff, which we, which we typically see. Yep. But then also 
kind of playing that through in my head, you've got this idea that the product team can adopt this mindset because they're the ones that can then start to drive, you know, success and, and some of the bets. And, you know, maybe if they get their portfolio right, as you say, then you're in a position where you can start to put the right amount of chips in the right parts of the table. But of course, you kind of touched on it yourself. There's this kind of quarterly sales problem, for example, if you're in a sales driven organization that they're always going to be coming to you, but and basically saying like, hey, we need feature X to win client Y or whatever. And this is now the most important thing. And in many organizations, and certainly some that I've seen, even all the way up to the leadership team, not just the product team, but like the, the CEO is 100% behind that because they want to make the numbers. They've got their quarterly yeah. targets. And again, yeah. they'd rather take the sure thing now than the, the maybe better thing later because that might not even work. So again, I guess it's all about how do you kind of, I guess, persuade, and that's got connotations, but persuade the CEO that, that this is a thing that you should do and that the potential benefits are higher than the benefits of what you'd be doing right now. I, I mean, that, that is, uh, if I had the kind of the silver bed answer to that, <laughs> I would not be sitting here. Oh, God I mean, damn it. No, no I, but, but I do think it's around... It's around influence and positioning, and that's one of the things I kind of I've seen some of the sort of the sort of best practices of where it's worked really well is where it's painting the picture. And, and as I say, from, from my point of view, it's around going understanding like what are you doing today, what you have to do today to, to meet the short term numbers, but then show if you don't start placing those bets today, then actually that's great. But come another three quarters down the line, the only way or four quarters or whatever it might be on that horizon. The only way you're going to continue to achieve growth is through cuts. And actually what you'll then start to manage is decline in business. And from, from many of the CEOs, actually, and most of the execs, yes, they're incentivized on today, but they also have long-term incentive plans. So it's the idea about continuing to create shareholder value beyond just kind of the next quarter. And I think that's where the balanced portfolio approach comes from. And, the, and then for me, it comes back to the, the governance you put over that, which is we're not just going to bet the bank on tomorrow. But by doing it in a way where when we're testing these bets, actually we, and again, this VC mindset where how you invest, which is, look, we're going to invest small amounts of money and, and actually they only get the nuts to to investment if they can demonstrate with data and proof points. So you're de-risking that investment. Whereas I'm sure you've probably seen this as well as I have, where suddenly we're going to bet the house on this one big bet and then we're going to run it for three years and it's not going to, it's going to miss the market. It's going to miss the revenue expectations. It's a huge cost. And then, basically that team gets that gets cut so it's it's a more prudent way and it's a more it's a it's a de-risked approach while still again not sacrificing today but making sure that you are allocating enough resources in the right direction to build for tomorrow but there's also another interesting point there and that's that quite often and again i've seen this i'm sure you have as well like the big bets the big all-in-one all or nothing like yeah this has to be a home run because we're throwing everything into it First of all, it's hard to defend those in many companies because, again, there's always that next thing. But also, when you do deliver the big thing on a promise that that was going to be the thing, sometimes it's not the thing. Like You just end up coming right. out the back of it. And it's like, well, yeah, we just spent six months doing you know, Project X, and now we're in exactly the same boat as before, apart from we didn't build Projects Y, Z, A, B, and C. We've yep. not got the returns even on the thing that we thought was a sure thing. So do you think that this is something that is easy to, I mean, what am I trying to say? Like, how many times does a CEO or a sales organization need to get burned by that thing happening, I guess, before they start to think maybe there's another way? Like, have you seen that kind of mindset shift yourself, like after maybe a few big bet disappointments? Or do you think that there's always just sort of a sort of a philosophical desire to, to do the big thing because it feels big and important? So it's it's interesting. When I was when I was at Pearson, we were we were asked sort of to lead this this sort of this transformation from print. Like, how do you help evolve the business model from print to digital first? And our first time we tried it, we went into the biggest business unit and said, "Right, we're going to help transform your business model." And basically, we were told to fuck off out the door. We're the we're the eight hundred pound gorilla. You're not coming in messing with us. We're we're fine, thank you very much. Where we did find, though, was our English language business. We're like, look, we know there's a big opportunity out there. We're not maximizing it. We want 
to adopt this approach so we can actually do that and actually see it as more because we, we actually have we're actually willing to do that and i think that to be fair is if you don't get the, that lean forward buy-in from the business then then you're you are on a you you're never you're never going to be able to make that progress because you're always going to get superseded by the the C, C, cro saying sod it like we need to hit numbers or the ceo so i think it's finding that right place to prove it. and once you prove it so actually when we work with the english language team and when i demonstrate success traction and and that was recognized at board level suddenly there was i won't say the the largest business unit came on board immediately but you were then able to kind of recruit others and, and start to sort of change the ways of working but it is a it is a and to be honest with you like this approach works if you get the right buy-in if it doesn't it can be hugely frustrating and as i'm not i'm not advocating it for all but i do think for those product leaders who want to build a really successful career that's with future skills for me the way i see things going with industries moving faster with disruption coming quicker those who can think like this and structure their product organizations to be able to respond in this kind of way, I think will deliver long-term value and will prove out in the end. Those who don't, well, I'm, again, I would assume that uh, what their start to see is, what they're managing is just cost-cutting continually because they can't actually innovate. And before, I mean, there was a great quote last week as an AWS summit. They said, like, if you've, if you've not even started with, with on looking at how AI can be integrated into your product, you're you're probably kind of eight to twelve months behind. So at the end of the year, if you haven't started, you're probably two to three years behind. And I think that's that's kind of symptomatic of why those leaders who I think will be successful in the future will have this kind of mindset to be able to respond with the market at speed. All right, so just a very quick word from my sponsor. Now, in my time building my consulting business, I occasionally have a eureka moment like when a certain tool becomes a legitimate game changer. That's why I'm excited to be back talking about Leadfeeder, a tool that helps you cut through your data and turn your website visitors into solid leads. Imagine knowing which companies are checking out your site, tracking their behavior and integrating it all with your CRM. Well, that's exactly what Leadfeeder does for you. Result? It becomes your secret weapon for targeted lead engagement, making it easier for your team to convert website traffic into sales. You can head over to leadfeeder.com slash try for a free demo and get a free extended premium trial when you let the rep know you found out about Leadfeeder through the One Night in Product podcast. Check the show notes for more details, but as for now, back to the show. I was going to talk a little bit about the kind of innovator's dilemma part of this as well, the idea that you've kind of got to put some of your, you know, you've got to put some of your eggs potentially in a new basket that may feel quite unappetizing to start with. But, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to get kodak or blockbusted. But I actually want to touch a little bit on that concept of like, oh, well, if you haven't started with AI now, then you're doomed. It's like, yeah, right. But is that really true? Because like the people or the vast majority of people that I see out there that are trying to bring AI into their products all kind of doing it in roughly the same way, right? They're using different data with it. They're using different prompt engineering and stuff like that. But like they're not going out and inventing new AI all the time. They're using the AI that other people are being inventing, which is great. Like that, I love the fact that that's all available. And I would definitely have killed for that years ago when I was working on trying yeah, to build so some good. of these things. But I don't know. I mean, I just find it curious, this idea that like, if you haven't started using ChatGPT's API yet, that you're already doomed. It feels like you could probably just start if you really wanted to, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think it's probably more about where you want to play in, in that space. So like, if you want to, so I, I, mean, I, think it's, I think you'll probably fall into two camps. I think you have organizations that will use AI to improve productivity of the workforce, and that will be the tools they the license in. I think the bit I think about this is more about actually, if you think you've got an unfair advantage, so if you think you've got a rich data source and you've not been building it and starting to think about LLMs and what your, what your strategy is around, are you going to build on top of an open source or do you think you've got unfair advantage? That for me is where I think you'll fall behind in terms of the, the development versus the, to your point, actually, I think it's going to be, a, <laughs> it's amusing at the moment watching Microsoft just freely bundling like they do with teams to co-pilot to every single enterprise they can and just flood the market most people go to go you've got co-pilot they go yeah i have no idea what i'm doing with it or how it's going to make my job more effective <laughs> but in theory we are we're, and and, it, and again it's almost the thing i could go back to my shelves and go hey look at my eye before it's co-pilot I, I think the, the falling behind is if you think you have you have the, you have a unique data set that allows you to build unique propositions then if you're not starting now, then actually you are going to be behind. 
Yeah, no, I'll buy that. So I guess your ultimate thesis there is that they need to start, you know, going back to that portfolio approach and placing some right. bets. They need to start placing some bets on that. What percentage of their bets do you think they should be placing on that based on your current assessment? To be fair, I mean, again, it, it gets no, and I think this is the really important thing. I think everyone tries and gives a standard answer, and it really does depend on the context of the organization, the risk appetite, but, and also where you, where you are in your kind of disruption curve in your industry. So some of the more, I mean, if I take education, which I, you know, I'm a huge believer in the power of what AI can do to education, you are probably in that 70, 20, 10 model where it's not being rapidly disrupted. It's still growing. So you're probably thinking around, 10% of your bets need to be in that kind of AI space. But if you're in a more kind of, if you're in a more sort of software as a service tech base, then you are probably wanting to put a larger percentage of more that 40, 30, 40% of your bets into, into that to be able to test and validate it. So uh, that's, that's the context for me. And I think that's the nuance, which, because I'm like you, I, I, I love people like Marty Kagan. I, I think they're so important for advancing the conversations of, of product and, and the role, particularly product first organizations. The bit that gets missed is the content. How does that, how do I translate that into the context of my organization? And I think that tends to be the gap that we see a lot, which is the principles are great, but we have to make it work. We have to meet the organization where we are today and help them build that where they want to be tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm all for that, obviously, and hopefully we can all advance that together. But our time is nearly at an end. I do have to ask, though, if people like to cut of your jib and want to come and find you after this, where can they, where can they come and do that? Uh, you can tap me up on LinkedIn. So it's just Chris Luck, uh, Aspire. You can find me on www.thisisaspire.com or on Twitter at handle CLOCK78. Oh, good old Twitter. Making a comeback. Oh, should I say X? Should I say X? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Elon's not going to be listening. All right, well, I'll make sure that everyone gets all of that stuff so they can come and find you. But as for now, thanks for your time and thanks for your hot take. Thanks, Jason. Much appreciated. Take care.